I'm Terry Coopers, a psychiatrist. I have an MD after my name. I have a practice of psychiatry. I have a practice of psychiatry in Oakland, California, and I am institute professor at the Wright Institute in Berkeley. There is no reason for death row to be inside a solitary confinement unit, but they are. What happened in the 1980s in the United States is that the prisons were out of control. There had been so much crowding, the population was four times what it had been 10 years earlier. There was violence, which we knew is correlated with crowding. There was a lot of mental illness, also correlated with uh, crowding. And there was a lot of suicide. So the prisons were out of control. The authorities decided, I told them that the, you have two crowded uh, prisons and if you want to calm the situation down, what you should do is change the sentencing laws, stop throwing people with minor drug offenses in prison, uncrowd the prisons, and supply more rehabilitation. They had also been cutting rehabilitation because of the ideology of not wanting to coddle prisoners. So they, the authorities did not listen to me and other experts giving them that opinion. Instead, they decided that there were only a few prisoners who were causing all of the trouble and they would lock them up inside the prison. And that was the advent of the solitary confinement unit. So they called them the worst of the worst or the super predators and they built entire prisons or cell blocks within a prison that would be all solitary confinement. And I'm talking about units that would have a thousand, two thousand cells. So it's not the whole of the old-fashioned prison where you go for 10 days or 30 days if you get in a fight. Now it's full-time solitary confinement and thousands of prisoners are being sent there. Almost as soon as they started doing that, with general population prisoners, they had the very foolhardy idea of moving death row inside the supermax prison. And that's what happened in state after state. So that today most death rows are inside a solitary confinement unit. The reason that I say there's no reason for that, it makes no sense, is the death row typically is not a very violent place. People facing the death penalty usually are pretty serious. They're older, they are working on their appeal, and they have no need to prove themselves in prison. So they don't fight with each other, and they tend to be very friendly with each other rather than having gang hostilities or racial hostilities. They tend to be very cooperative and friendly. So there's absolutely no penological objective to putting death row inside solitary confinement. Yet in the United States, that's what's done over and over. Now, from a, a medical point of view, what have you seen happen to people who are put on death row in those solitary supermax confinement units? Well, we know that um, there is a lot of mental illness on death row. I believe there is more mental illness today than there was before death row was put inside solitary confinement. So I can only tell you what my reasoning is about that. We know that people without mental illness in solitary confinement have a number of symptoms. Just interviewing prisoners around the country in solitary confinement, I find that they complain of a lot of anxiety, they complain of disordered thinking, paranoia, mounting anger, despair. They despair that they'll ever get out of solitary. There's a lot of suicidal thinking and a lot of suicide attempts and actually successful suicides. 50% of all su prison suicides happen among the three or five percent who are in solitary confinement. People who have a tendency to be mentally ill, for instance, someone who eventually becomes schizophrenic, but is not yet showing any signs of psychosis, if you put them in solitary confinement, they will have a psychotic breakdown. And people who do have a history of mental illness, for instance, schizophrenia or bipolar or major affective disorder, the, the solitary confinement will exacerbate their mental illness, make it much worse, create an acute episode. Now all of that, so the people without mental illness have a lot of symptoms and they're very damaged. People with mental illness become more seriously disturbed. Now people on death row have more problems still and these problems compound each other. So we have the death row phenomena, which is a legal term, it's not a psychiatric term. And what it means is that people on death row have two main problems from being on death row. One is the ups and downs of their appeals. So they're like on a roller coaster. First they feel that they're going to win their appeal, then their hopes are dashed 
and that creates emotional havoc for them. If there's someone who's prone to schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, that the stress event in itself is probably going to induce a uh, psychiatric episode. Then there's also the loss of the only people they know in the world. Many people on death row do not have good contact with their family or anyone else outside. They don't have visits. The only people they know are on death row. And periodically, someone on death row is killed, maybe the person in the next cell. And so they're losing friends right and left. And those things add up and cause a level of despair and dysfunction. So now when you add the stress of isolated confinement for anyone who will get anxiety, paranoia, anger, uh, concentration problems, memory problems, then add in the factor that those who are prone to mental illness are going to have an exacerbation of their mental illness, possibly suicide, and then add to that the death row phenomena and the particular stresses of being on death row, and you get a situation that just breeds mental illness and suicide on death row. Now, some people would say that's a necessary evil. Those people were legally sentenced to death, and if that's the medical consequence of that fact, uh, there is not much we can do about it. Do you think there is something to be done uh, about the situation you're describing? Yes, first of all, that opinion is foolhardy. I believe that the reason we have constitutional rights and the reason we have human rights and the reason why we have international agreements about torture is not for the torture of you or me. It's for the torture of someone who is caught during a war or it's for the torture of someone who has committed a serious crime they cannot be tortured because of agreements. When we think about our human relations and how we want to live together, we've made a decision that torture is not acceptable. That does not mean that certain people are an exception and because they've done something or they are something, for instance, of a different color, that then they're, it's okay to torture them. That is not what our covenants on torture uh, assume. We have uh, standards that we uh, maintain because that's what we think it means to be human. And so those things have to be followed even when the person we're talking about has done a serious crime. Now the other thing is a lot of people on death row have not done serious crimes. That is, a lot of times they will be convicted of something falsely, that they're innocent, or their crime won't be that serious. One of the uh, main reasons women are in death row is because they were driving a car and their boyfriend told them to stop here. The boyfriend gets out of the car with a gun that they did not know the boyfriend had, goes into a liquor store, robs the liquor store, and in the process of the robbery, kills somebody. Then that boyfriend puts the gun back in his pocket and runs out and says, let's get out of here, and the woman drives away. That woman is accessory to a murder and is probably going to get the death sentence. She has, she's not a heinous criminal. And so there are many situations, I could describe others, where the people on death row actually, because of circumstances, are, are put there. But they're not heinous criminals. And then there are a few multiple murderers, and I think they're really the very small minority on death row. But I think what we have to do as social policy is decide what we consider human, what we consider to be human rights, what agreements we want to make about the treatment of prisoners, and then there can't be exceptions because someone did something or other.